So let's start since we have some people in here. Uh, hi, <laughs> thanks for being here in the first panel. It's great to, to be studying the first uh, uh, panel after the, the great opening. That was amazing. Thank you, Nicolo. This panel is about antitrust, data protection, and privacy, what has happened so far. And we have the pleasure to be here with uh, two people in, in, in person and two people online. We are going to share the screen um, later to, to make it easier to so you can see them. Uh, to introduce myself, I am Camila Leite. I am a speci specialist in digital rights and telecommunications in EDEC, the Brazilian Institute of Consumers Defense, a 35 years old organization that works to protect consumer in, in several fields, uh, including in the digital sphere. And we make this effort to intertwine consumer law and also competition law and data protection. And in here, we have this panel about this, uh, this intersection and how authorities deal with that in digital markets. So I will start presenting our panelists. First of all, uh, the panelists that are here with us, I have in my left side, Bruno Renzetti, which is a lecturer of competition law and regulation at INSPU, uh, University here in Brazil, and associate attorney at Hapner Crude Advogados. We also have Nicolo Zingales, which is a professor of information law and regulation at FGV, where he leads FGV's e-commerce research cluster. And it is also a UNDP consultant in digital markets for CADE. And online, we have also uh, Maria Paz, which is a lawyer and head of legal policy and research for Global Partners Digital, a social purpose company working to enable digital environment underpinned by human rights, and Erika Douglas, who is an associate professor at Temple University Business School of Law and has recently published an amazing article about uh, agency collaboration in the digital regulatory ecosystem. To make this panel more dynamic and so we can have a fresh start, we are dividing our, our panel in, in two moments. First of all, we'll have three rounds of quick conversations, quick uh, answers uh, in main questions of these intersections. And then we are going past the floor to you. We want to hear your questions on uh, how to develop in this intersection and how this is being developed. So to, uh, to start, let's start more, uh, more broadly, more generally about how privacy and uh, data protection is being used, um, is, is connected in competition law. And before passing the floor to our panelists, I would like also to emphasize that EDAC and Data Privacy Brazil, which is also an NGO from, uh, from here in Brazil, we have just published a book on this intersection on uh, data, digital markets, and competition law, Dados, Mercados Digitais e Concorrência, which is available uh, freely online. So you can all access in both our websites. Uh, we can uh, send the link to you later. But let's understand more of this intersection. And I will start with Bruno, and then I will go online to Erika, Maria Paz, and Nicolo. You will have each one four minutes in this first part. So Bruno, how does competition law, privacy, and data protection interconnect? That's a tough question. Uh, thanks, Camila, and uh, feel free to interrupt me if I go over my time. Uh, thanks, everyone who's attending the panel. Um, so when Camila and I came up with the idea for the panel and the title uh, is self-explanatory, what has happened so far? Because we've seen for at least the past 10 years, this great interest in how data protection and privacy uh, would uh, connect with antitrust and how antitrust authorities would um, look at those elements when analyzing both mergers and conducts. But what has happened? Well, what do we see um, in practice? And I think for us to really understand um, what, do, what lies forward or what has happened so far, we need to take a step back to understand what is the real connection between data privacy protection and um, antitrust. And for me, I think the most compelling argument uh, for this change is that antitrust has always been very focused on price and price standards and how price affects competition and price as the main standard of competition between firms. And nowadays we see that with the advent of zero price markets, um, price is not so, not so much important anymore. Uh, there is lots of um, competition on privacy standards or how to protect your, your own data. Um, so 
it seems to me that it is um, impossible nowadays to really analyze antitrust without taking into consideration privacy standards and data protection. Uh, and the most recent development on that field was the July 4th decision of the European Court of Justice on the Meta case uh, originating from Germany. We could have a whole panel discussing the case, uh, but that, that decision um, is very much straightforward uh, on how those two fields interact, on how um, national competition authorities and data protection authorities should interact. And I think it just lays the ground. Um, if there was any doubt remaining on whether antitrust should um, care about privacy or data protection, I think those doubts um, do not exist anymore after the, the European decision. So uh, I believe that our task as academics, as practitioners, um, as people in the civil society and as, as activists is to really understand um, what changes are happening um, in the concrete world. Um, and not only in the papers, not only in our discussions, but how authorities have analyzed those matters um, in the past few years. And I think that all comes up to the decision uh, of the European Court of Justice. So that's just some um, initial remarks on the, on the topic. Thanks, Bruno. I will pass over to Erica. Thanks so much for letting me join remotely. I hope to see everyone in person another year. And Camille, please let me know if you can't hear me well. Um, that was a great start to what we're going to talk about here today, Bruno. And I'll just flag competition and privacy laws, sort of the theme that you raised, they're interacting more than ever before. And so I think your point was primarily the antitrust should care about data privacy. I think it's also well worth sort of the privacy attorneys in the room taking some time to understand uh, the implications for competition because they're going to be um, issues for your clients. And so a few examples of where this is appearing, um, just to show its significance, the Global Privacy Assembly is paying attention to this space. So the organization comprised of the leaders of privacy agencies around the world. And I helped them to draft a report on this space. So along with Camille's report, there's plenty of reading here. Um, and then there's agencies and courts around the world I gave one example in the EU that are acting on matters that relate to both privacy and competition. The US where I practice is certainly very active in that area as well. Um, our, one of our antitrust agencies has retained an expert in crossing over between privacy and competition. Um, the UK and Canada are also doing a lot in this space. Um, and I know the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is also looking at it. So this is a very, um, it used to be something that primarily academics were interested in, and I'll count myself in that, but it's really become an active area of, of enforcement that matters um, to counseling clients. So I think if we just step back for one second to frame the discussion at a sort of 10,000 foot view, a lot of the narrative in this space is that the two areas of policy are complementary. Um, and I think that's probably true, but I also just wanna emphasize that they can actually be in tension at times. And I hope that we'll talk about both today. Um, but if you think about complementarity I think both privacy and competition policy are seeking to promote trust in markets. So if individuals don't trust it, that their data will be handled in accordance with reasonable, uh, the reasonable expectations of privacy, they won't engage in those markets. And if they don't engage in those markets, then that affects competition. Um, and so strong data privacy laws and their enforcement can set the stage for digital competition. And both of the areas are also fairly focused on consumer choice. So certainly, um, privacy law and notice and consent paradigms, which are still dominant in the US, um, but also antitrust in that it tries to promote competition which provides consumers with choice. If there's a merger or if there's exclusionary conduct that can stop, that can prevent consumers from having choice in the marketplace so they could have poorer choices. Um, so there's the sort of complementarity story, but let me spend 30 seconds on the sort of tension story as well. Um, these two areas of policy can pull in opposing directions or can need some reconciliation. Um, and an example of that is just that competition in the digital economy, as everyone in this room knows, often depends on extensive processing of personal data, right? Apps, online ads, search, those are all easy examples driven by personal data. 
And so antitrust law is seeking to promote competition in all of those services. And that may mean more personal data flow, more processing, more collection. Um, and in contrast, data protection law or data privacy law, which I think we're sort of using interchangeably in this conversation so far, um, can seek to limit data flows, okay? It, can, it seeks to instill sort of greater individual control over those data flows. So that's an oversimplification for time, but I think it's true that stronger data privacy laws around the world, and we can all attest to the fact that they are becoming stronger, are creating more questions about how we design for competition and privacy. And there's a lot of cases and examples that we'll get into today that uh, speak to that. Thanks. The timing was perfect. My alarm, my alarm just ring it. <laughs> so Maria Paz, you have the floor. Thank you. So for continuing this conversation, following the line of my previous colleagues that have intervened, um, I want to also deal with the with, with the issue of how these tensions and complementarities can be reflected in the need of like looking for for new theories of harm when we are looking into how to build these uh, uh, antitrust cases based also in 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 privacy violation that can happen in the digital markets. I think that in, in that sense, we have seen uh, a few years ago, um, see an evolution that started mainly uh, in the merger control side, but slightly had been uh, evolving also for examining the, the, the theories of abuse of dominant positions, uh, the most recent case that was highlighted by Bruno. So I think that in, in, in this sense, again, uh, takes relevant what Erica was pointed out in terms of the complementarities and tensions. Uh, when we are looking into building these new uh, theories of harm, we need to think about how uh, this uh, um, access to uh, personal data had become kind of the, 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 the raw material of the functioning of the digital market. So in that sense, we have the tension of like being mindful of what are the limitations that are prescripted by the data protection framework that exists in place. But on the other hand, how, for example, the theories of harm need to account for a um, um, mechanism of like breaking the monopoly that can be built in, in, in the holding of the data in order to ensure that over the future, there is a healthy competition environment in which there are many different actors that can have access to uh, this um, uh, raw material that is basic for the development and the innovation of uh, new services. So in that sense, again, we, we can see this tension. And one of the challenges that also had become appearing uh, when uh, we examine the, the, the possibilities in building this theory of harm is this need also um, of like disentangle the possibilities of having harms, uh, competitive harms, in the market that are exclusively linked with the, the, the consumer welfare, which were for many years the dominant theories in antitrust uh, doctrine and, 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 and jurisprudence. So in that sense, looking not only in, 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 in what can be like the, the short term impact in the data concentration that is happening in the market, but also what could be the long run impacts in terms of the availability of services and how um, the possibility to ensure um, more diversity of actors in, in digital market. It's also a possibility of like push them for providing conditions in terms of uh, privacy protection that they uh, offer to their user that consider privacy actually a quality of the product in which the companies can be competitive on. So they are not only competi competing in price, uh, which is the, the focus that um, Bruno was highlighting that need to be abandoned to understand how privacy and, and, and antitrust engage, but also consider particularly how, for example, this can be uh, in, in the case of a um, merger analysis, an element that should be taken into consideration in building the counterfactuals in terms of the structure of the market. And in that sense, uh, a lot has been uh, pointed out in terms of like that this uh, structural way to look at competition should not 
only focus in, in the in the final um, uh, user welfare, but also focus in the possibility of business to access to, to, to data and also offer competitive conditions in terms of better data protection. So my last point that I want to do in this, and probably Erica will uh, uh, go deeper in this uh, during our uh, conversation today, is the need for building these new theories of harm, either from the side of uh, uh, abuse uh, conduct or emergent control. We need much more cross collaboration between different bodies. So we have mentioned already antitrust and data protection, but there's also a layer to add on, on consumer protection that is also relevant in terms to better understand, gather the data and understand how um, this uh, access to personal data is very relevant in terms of the building of the market and the future of the market and the possibilities of innovation in the market and understand better what are the tipping points that can happen and, and create situation of concentration that will be really difficult to sort out in the future. And in the same side, if for the abuse uh, uh, conduct, understand better how uh, the, the situation of control of, of data and concentration of data can create logs in, in which they are very difficult, they are much more difficult for consumers to find uh, the services with the quality that really is mindful for their uh, uh, privacy. And in general, it can impact in the medium or long term the possibility of having more innovative services at their disposal. So I will leave it there for continuing the conversation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Maria Paz, Erica, Bruno, and Nicolo for, uh, for participating in this panel. I will end the, this first round with Nicolo. Thank you, Camila. And thank you very much, both of you, for the invitation. Um, it's great to have this discussion also from people from all over the world. Um, so I uh, think that also in this discussion, we need to include the role of consumer protection. I know uh, I will be a little bit of a maverick here because we, we want to focus just on those two areas, but uh, it seems like it's part of the equation, uh, right? So uh, you have antitrust that uh, takes care of the external market failures. Uh, so trying to make sure that Consumers have a good menu of options to choose from. Uh, then you have internal market failures, which are the internal to the consumer. So how they're, they're being persuaded to, to buy something or they're being fooled you know, in some way. So that's the consumer protection part. And data protection kind of puts these two together uh, by saying, I will both empower consumers by giving them access to data, understanding better how the decisions are made, and also protecting them, uh, you know, against domination. Uh, so, because a lot of what uh, data protection is about is uh, correcting uh, the information asymmetries that there are involved in the uh, processing of personal data. So, by that, you also uh, fix or uh, minimize uh, the power asymmetry. So, I think in that way, antitrust and data protection are both concerned with tackling power in some way. Uh, but I think uh, it's also uh, important uh, to understand how to use uh, data privacy within competition analysis. Uh, and so to that extent, I think we can uh, think about cases like the um, Facebook uh, Bundeskartell investigation, which we'll discuss certainly later, uh, but where data protection was used as a, as a reference, as a benchmark for conduct that is, let's say, abnormal. And so this is similar to what would happen in uh, context, for example, of uh, tax uh, violations. Uh, I mean, to some extent it's similar, uh, where a company uh, doesn't pay taxes and by that it gets a competitive advantage compared to others, you know, and it manages to make lower prices and eliminate others from the market. So to that extent, if there is a violation, we can treat it similarly. But I think what is different in data protection is that you also put uh, potentially at risk people, not necessarily creating a violation, you know, but you increase the risk of exposure of the personal data uh, and uh, you undermine to some extent their autonomy in uh, uh, the decision that to regard them, uh, depending on how the personal data are being treated and so on. So, uh, I think that a concept that is powerful to kind of reconcile the goals of antitrust and privacy is consumer sovereignty. Uh, 
uh, consumer sovereignty is a concept that has been coined in antitrust discussion to mean that uh, um, the market uh, functioning basically will depend on the wishes of consumers. So the consumer with their purchasing decisions are able to drive the way that competitors uh, battle up between themselves in, in the market. Um, so this goes a bit beyond the classic understanding of consumer welfare. Uh, we can discuss, you know, to what extent is already covered by consumer welfare, but I think that's, that's a powerful concept. And it can promote autonomy. So in the end, what we want to promote is what we're discussing in the plenary, also uh, autonomy of consumers. Uh, another way in which antitrust can be uh, considering the privacy aspects is through the fundamental rights lens. So, of course... Uh, you know, we have also this in other areas of uh, antitrust. Um, so when it comes to, for example, uh, the prices of medicines and whether a company can refuse to sell some uh, uh, patents or li licenses to patented technologies that can put in danger the whole population. Think about Brazil, you know, uh, a lot of people need some medicaments and all of a sudden the prices are too high or the companies don't want to license it. Uh, here, the government intervenes because it wants to save citizens. You know, uh, it's, it's a clear case because there is a right to life involved. But we can adopt a similar approach when it comes to privacy and data protection, saying, you know, there is a, a red line that you cannot cross. Uh, and on this basis, the authority should intervene to uh, re, uh, secure that fundamental right. So not just looking at the efficiency in the market. And this is an aspect that I think uh, comes up when we are trying to reconcile the concepts of innovation that are used in uh, data protection on one hand and uh, uh, antitrust on the other. Too often in antitrust, when you're trying to justify a conduct, uh, you basically will need to show some efficiencies that are typically not understood in a very broad sense, uh, but they, they refer mainly to some technical improvement or, uh, you know, uh, better efficiency in distributing a certain asset. And uh, we need to also start considering a better sense of trust, as it was said earlier, for citizens, uh, you know, as an improvement, as, an, as a potential innovation defense. Um, so I think uh, that uh, this is first uh, provocation about how we can consider those elements. That was fantastic. Thank you for, for these answers that uh, my head is full of questions for you. Uh, and talking about questions, we have uh, the Slido link in here. So if you have questions, you can either enter on the QR code or use the link. And we will also have a moment to take like two quick questions in here too, but feel free to, to add on that. And just to uh, comment a little on the, on the, the answers that were presented, uh, and for, especially for Erika and Maria Paz, in here we have mostly data protection laws. So it's very interesting that we are talking uh, inside uh, competition law tools, but also criticizing that in the sense that we have to understand the limitations and on how these two fields can cooperate. Uh, Bruno also mentioned the Bundeskartellamt decision, um, the, the European Union decision on uh, on on the, the Facebook case, which is very important. And I hope that you can comment that on, uh, later too, because I think that this could influence Brazil also on how data protection authority and the competition authority intertwine and also other jurisdictions. Uh, also, I, I really liked what Nicolo mentioned about fundamental rights. Because uh, sometimes we separate these different fields as isolately, but this is just a, a fictional way of law to divide uh, different fields. We have to make this combination and to understand the real issues, which is about the consumers, which is about data subjects and how this affects people in the end. But we are talking more broadly on theory on how these interconnections are made, but we also can talk about practice. Uh, so how um, competition authority is applying these concepts in practice, how data protection is being used inside competition law. So I will provoke our panelists to present some cases, both, um, both conduct cases and mergers that are important in data protection issues. And this time I will start with Maria Paz and then I will pass to Erika, Nicolo and Bruno. And now you have three minutes. Good luck with that. Thank you. 
So in my case, I'm going to refer to the WhatsApp case. Uh, this is the updating of the uh, privacy policy in terms of services of WhatsApp that happened in 2021. Um, this it's an interesting case in, case because of the cross jurisdictional impact that it had. This was a global update, but there, there had some nuances in in terms of the update for the EU, particularly because EU have a strong data protection regulation that made uh, some of the changes that were applied in other places of the world not compliant with the GDPR. So the company decided to provide an update of their policies that it was particularly tailored for being in compliance with the GDPR in the case of Europe. But for the rest of the countries around the world, the, the, the terms of, of service and, and privacy policy was updated in a way that um, make uh, even more um, uh, even easier uh, for um, WhatsApp to connect and uh, and being able to leverage the the data uh, that it was uh, being um, shared by the users on Facebook and also the other way around so basically this is something that it was the result of the merger between uh, Facebook and and uh, WhatsApp that happened in 2014 that came initially with a, a commitment from the company with the authorities in the EU and in the US of not um, using this merger as an opportunity to consolidate the, the, the access to data from users from the two platforms. But over the time, the company uh, uh, actually didn't fulfill this commitment, this uh, gave a place also to, to a an, an specific enforcement in the US uh, with, with, uh, with fines finally for the company. But the thing that over the time, this uh, implied that the company was updating uh, its policies in, in, in WhatsApp for like communicating that they will be using the data coming from WhatsApp for, for Facebook purposes and, and the other way around. So at the end, with the 21st changes in, implied, it was the consolidation of this path, but it was already happening from 2016 but also uh, adding an additional layer because in, in, particular, in this particular case, the update included also the use of uh, uh, WhatsApp as a business uh, platform. This is really highly relevant. We are talking 21, uh, 2021, we were in the middle of the pandemic of COVID. Many small businesses started to use it in a more, much more intensive way. The, the WhatsApp as a business platform, particularly for, for small and medium uh, um, companies. So this was really relevant. And considering that the, the, the landscape in different jurisdictions, which is particularly the case of Latin America, in which the, the participation of WhatsApp in the, in the market of uh, uh, um, apps, uh, sorry, messaging apps, it's really higher. And um, this provide the opportunity of this updating of the condition uh, as an, a, an opportunity of leveraging the dominant position that or already WhatsApp have in, in messaging, uh, service, uh, messaging services for uh, uh, um, fooling this platform that is more kind of a, an e-commerce business oriented platform. So what was interesting in this case that it, it had combination in the two sides. The element that was taken on in some jurisdiction, particularly I have the opportunity to, to analyze in, a, in an article that I, uh, I wrote with my colleague, uh, Michel de Sousa, um, about how the case was examined in Argentina, in Chile, and in Brazil. So the, the elements that were curious in, in this three, juri, three jurisdiction in, in Latin America is, is that all of them have some level of involvement of authorities from the consumer side, the competition side, and the data protection side. The three of them, what element was curious that they deal in a different way, depending on the strength of their institutionalities in these three different fields for like really being able to take on the case and assess what was the harm that they considered that was happening. Interesting, for, for example, the, the Argentinian case had a very quick and, and, and strong response from the data protection, sorry, for the consumer protection side. 
So they find uh, imme almost immediately the, the company uh, with, with a very quick process because they considered that the changes that were being uh, promoted, um, they, they were like restricting, restrict, restrictingly in an un unduly way, the option of the consumers. So they didn't have a meaningful way to um, not consent to the change in the policy and, and don't allow the sharing of their personal data in the way in which the company had uh, 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 been informed in, in the changes of the policy. So they considered that that by itself, it was an infraction to the data protection, uh, sorry, it's to the consumer protection regulation in Argentina. In the case of Chile, for example, the approach was more advanced by the side of the uh, antitrust uh, authorities. So uh, an investigation was triggered by the, the Fiscalía uh, Nacional Económica, which is the authority that is prosecuting the, case, the antitrust case, cases, but looking more to the ability of using this change of condition as an opportunity to build on the, um, the, um, the, the dominance of the company because of the access to this data to leverage in, in terms of the service for uh, the small and medium companies in this business uh, service provided by WhatsApp. So it was a different approach, like looking to more, not the, the the agency directly for the consumer, but the more oral impacts in terms of the, the structure of the market and the ability that the company will have to leverage their dominance in the messaging for uh, 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 limiting the options and the competition in the market of the services that will be provided to a small and medium businesses. The, the case there is still ongoing. Maria, uh, yeah, sorry, I am closing. Sorry, sorry. to interrupt. Uh, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, just because of the time, could you could you complete your the the final analysis on that on the next question that I think that interrelates also to to this article. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm just missing the the analysis uh, from Brazil. So there, what I will just mention it, and and I can uh, uh, dig uh, deeper later on is the cross-cutting nature of the approach in Brazil, in which there was a close collaboration between the three authorities, data protection, consumer, and um, antitrust authorities. So that we can deep uh, uh, later, go we'll deep later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Paz. I will pass to Erica. Thanks, Camille. I look forward to hearing more about it, Maria Paz. Um, I, I just want to talk about the original case in this space in the US, and then the most recent case in the space in the US. And these are both uh, antitrust cases, but they relate to privacy. So understanding how antitrust views privacy to your question, Camille, really means going back to Google's acquisition of DoubleClick, which is now once again in the news, there's a new antitrust case about it. But originally when it happened in 2007, the Federal Trade Commission, one of two antitrust enforcers in the US, reviewed this acquisition to determine whether it would have negative effects on competition. And in doing that, the agency recognized for the first time this idea of privacy as quality. And it's really become the prevailing view in other jurisdictions as well, um, the EU and Canada, definitely. And what I mean by this idea of privacy as quality is where Bruno started us off today. Purchasing decisions can be based on price, but if you think of the last thing you bought, it may not have only been price-based for your decision. It could have been the quality of the product, the services that come along with it, how innovative it was. And individuals might also consider privacy when they're selecting among products and services that are available. Does a smartphone protect my privacy? Does a browser protect my privacy? Um, and is that a reason to choose it? And so the FTC really acknowledged for the first time in Google double click that in some markets, and it's market dependent, um, privacy could be the basis of consumer choice and therefore the basis of competition. And that kind of started at the interactions between these two fields. So that's what I mean when, when I say privacy is quality. And, and the Google case was a merger case back in 2007. And what's interesting since then is that now we're seeing the same theory of privacy quality start to appear in conduct cases. And by that, I mean not transactions, but an individual company doing something to impact competition. And a very high profile example of this, also an ongoing case, is the FTC's case against Meta. This is really the first government abuse of dominance or monopolization case um, that recognizes data privacy can be the basis for competition. 
The case started in 2020. Um, it's now in discovery and will likely go to trial in 2024. Um, but the FTC is accusing, I'll call them Facebook, uh, but Meta, of using its market power to erode online data privacy. That's part of the allegations. Um, and the case more broadly sort of centers on um, Facebook's pattern of acquiring nascent competitors, what they call the buy or bury strategy, um, which the FTC is alleging is a violation of, of U.S. antitrust law. But what's interesting for this conversation is that the FTC is arguing that Facebook used its market power over social media markets to lower levels of privacy quality. So to make them lower than what they would have been in a competitive market for social media services. And the claims um, are really specific. They say that Facebook, and these aren't proven yet, but the allegation is that Facebook caused a decline in consumer choice, which meant fewer data privacy protection options around the amount and nature of advertising and the availability and quality of data privacy protective options in social media services. Um, so sort of more use of data and less options to control the use of that data. And it's really early on in this case, but in the initial motions, the judge in this case um, in, in Washington, D.C. has recognized it's plausible that consumers would prefer a social networking service that's more privacy protective. And I think this group, we would probably accept that as truth, but it's interesting to see it being recognized in judicial decisions for the first time. Um, so this is a case to watch. It's still a case that's developing, but it's, I'd say, the foremost example of privacy and antitrust interacting in, in a pending case in the U.S. right now. Thanks. Thanks, Erica. That's amazing to recover uh, something that was discussed more than 10 years ago, and now this uh, same justification or a similar one is being used right now to assess another case. But I will pass to Nicola right now to talk a little more on other cases. Thank you, Camila. I, I brought just a very uh, one slide uh, to show you something I've been working on, uh, which is a paper. Uh, well, I don't know if how much people can see from here, but uh, it's um, paper where I'm trying to uh, point out what the challenges are in tackling data-related abuses. Uh, and so here I put uh, all the characteristics of data, uh, you know, on the vertical line. And uh, here are the types of um, conducts that are being investigated by antitrust. And what I want to focus on here uh, for the purpose of this conversation is just this part here, which is individualization. So data can be used to individualize uh, the, the, the action to one specific target and make it more effective. Uh, so here, maybe use, uh, let the first part, um, uh, exploitative discrimination, excluded discrimination. Um, well, it's obvious, it's not clear when uh, you are being offered a different price, how prevalent that is. So, because one of the reasons why we uh, want to condemn private discrimination from a competitional perspective traditionally is that, you know, if uh, it doesn't lead to an increase of output. So like in the case of Uber, uh, Uber increases the price because it wants more drivers to be on the road when it's most needed. So that is a legitimate reason for using. However, if the price is uh, change, changing depending on the person who is uh, calling the Uber, maybe because they have a low battery, etc. This is no longer a measure to increase output. It's a measure to exploit the consumer. But we don't know how prevalent that is. So maybe they do it only for a few people. And that is not enough to say, well, this is an anti-competitive economy. Maybe it's an issue that doesn't have to deal, be dealt with by competition law, but by consumer protection or data protection law. Uh, with regard to exclusive uh, agreements and loyalty rebates, What's the problem? The problem there is that the company can uh, have an installed base of customers to which is selling a lot of its products and it wants to convince them to buy more from it than from other competitors. So uh, the, here the theory that is used is called leveraging. So you leverage your position in the installed base of customers to expand your market power into uh, the additional part that you didn't have. Uh, how do you do this analysis of application of leveraging when you don't know how many targets there are for this strategy? So if the company can uh, uh, precisely um, put the price that it knows, it convinces some people to make the switch, 
because of all the data that it has with them, uh, it makes it more difficult to analyze from a, an antitrust a traditional perspective, you know, if there is a leveraging. And this is, by the way, something that is currently being discussed in the case involving iFood and the food voucher program. Uh, so they are, uh, there's a food voucher program that allows employers to give um, discounted uh, meals to employees. And uh, uh, iFood is one of the uh, most powerful food delivery apps for consumers. But it also provides, uh, you know, this uh, platform for full vouchers that it offers to, uh, to companies. And here, what it's alleged in the complaint is that they are using the data regarding uh, some of their clients that are also CEOs of these companies to, uh, to convince them to make the switch uh, for the whole company. Right. So that's another uh, issue that I want to point out. With regard to uh, excessive pricing, as Bruno said, yeah, we should go beyond uh, the use of just prices for uh, making uh, transactions in the market. Uh, the Argentinian authority in the WhatsApp case also said this is an excessive and irrational data collection. However, what we have in competition law is a test that is based on uh, whether uh, the price that is imposed is uh, uh, far beyond the reasonable uh, economic value of the product. Now, how do you calculate that when you don't know if consumers are really okay with some data collection or not? Some of them might perceive uh, more advertisement as a disutility. Uh, so how do you make this calculation? That's one of the challenges. And finally, also with regard to tying, tying is this conduct where you uh, force people to buy a secondary product from you because you are dominant and you, uh, yeah, you, you ask them to buy both. And so here, the problem is that you need to prove coercion in competition law. So showing that the consumers are being forced to buy the second. Now, if all of a sudden you have all this data, you can really make it attractive for the consumer on the basis of all the knowledge that you have of them to buy the secondary product. It's not technically speaking coercion, but it is a strong invitation that is very likely to be accepted. So how do we consider that? Uh, that's another question. And finally, if you allow me the last point here, I don't, on refusal to deal, it's another important category of conduct where we refuse to uh, sell something to your competitors. Uh, here, we don't have an issue of individualization, but we have an issue of what I was telling you earlier about the innovation uh, considerations that are accepted as a justification in competition law. So can we recognize privacy as a technical development? If somebody wants to make a, the same service, think about threads now uh, compared to uh, Twitter. You know, it's basically a clone. Uh, but there are some new features. I don't know if there's anybody of Meta here, but it's a very similar service, right? However, it might have better policies, including better privacy protections. So would it be uh, fair for uh, somebody to say, well, they are, by refusing to give me, by refusing to give me the, functioning of the algorithm of Twitter, they are not allowing me to offer a more privacy preserving product that is very similar, but it's better for consumer for that way. Uh, so I think that was it. Uh, sorry for the long. Um, yeah, so just to wrap up this, this topic, uh, I think it's useful to talk about the Google Fitbit merger um, as well um, a few years ago. Um, Google uh, bought Fitbit. I think Fitbit was not very popular in Brazil at the time. Uh, it's like a wearable, like the Apple Watch, uh, much more popular in the West. Um, and then Google um, proposed this acquisition to the European regulator, and it was cleared um, in 2020 after a lot of discussion. Um, what is interesting about this case is that privacy and data protection um, was not seen as a um, competitive standard, but there was a really um, interesting concern of the protection of data itself um, due to the fact that Fitbit collects a, a vast amount of data related to health uh, mainly. And as we know, health data is very sensitive. And the competition authority was very um, concerned about how Google would um, deal with that data, especially regarding advertisement if Google would use the health data to promote target advertisements. So it was a long case, um, lots of discussions, long, long opinion by the European Commission. 
Um, and at the end, the merger was cleared, but with many remedies. And one of the remedies regarding advertisement was the mandatory creation of data silos for 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so Google must separate the health data acquired from Fitbit from any other data it acquires. So Google cannot use the Fitbit data to foster um, its advertisements. Um, this uh, merger, this clearance of the merger was not without criticism. Those many scholars um, wrote, wrote papers about the, the merger and how the commission um, did not find that good enough solution, uh, especially because the remedy is very hard to monitor. It's very hard to monitor whether Google is in fact separating the data and not employing the data in the, um, in the goals that was not supposed to. So um, one of the arguments against the case is that if the remedy is too hard to monitor, um, why don't we just block the operation? Um, it creates a huge cost to the authority to monitor the, the remedy. Uh, and another um, point that has been raised lately is that the Google Fitbit case uh, was analyzed before the DMA. So what would have happened um, had the DMA been in force um, when Google um, submitted the transaction to the European Commission? Uh, I think the, the outcome would be very different um, if the DMA was in force back then. Uh, but what we have now is that Google um, did clear the operation with all the with all these remedies, and I think our task as um, scholars or um, civil society is just to see where it goes and how the remedy is in fact um, monitored. Thank you, everyone. So we had Maria Paz presenting a case that was analyzed in different jurisdictions and had some different responses to, uh, depending on which authority analyzed that. Erica brought a case that was a merger case that was presented more than 10 years ago and has influenced the business model and how competition authorities analyze these issues. Nicolo has presented concretely which conducts uh, can, uh, can be worrisome in digital markets. And uh, Bruno brought a merger that it was recently presented, but was presented before a regulation that has some impact in competition law too. So we are uh, starting to, deep, to deepen our analysis on these intersections. And we, until now, we were talking more inside competition law on uh, how this is being assessed. But we also have some opportunities and we also had some cases of concrete collaboration. Maria Paz was just starting to mention that on the WhatsApp case in Brazil, for example. So I would like to hear more from all panelists on how can policy on these two fields can be developed and strengthened and how the cooperation is being, is being and can be developed. And before passing the floor to the panelists, I will come back uh, after, after I, I stop talking, I will come back to the slide of the questions and I will provoke you to think about questions too, because after these answers, we are going to, to pass to the final round of questions and final remarks. And this time we will start with Erica and then Maria Paz, Bruno and Nicolo. Please, Erica. Thank you. So I think the important message here is that you and your clients, if you counsel in privacy, can expect to see a lot more collaboration between competition and privacy authorities. And I think that has come across from our discussion here today. Um, but let me delve into what that actually means. More information flow between the agencies, joint investigations and cases between the agencies, um, and in the UK, there's probably one of the leading examples of that, aside from the one that Bruno just gave us, um, there was a joint investigation into Google's privacy sandbox, into changes it made um, in terms of who could have cookies on Google Chrome and who could have access to them. Because if you think of advertisers having access to cookies on Google Chrome, that enables them to compete um, with Google. And so there, both the privacy and the competition authorities were involved in investigating a change that Google was making. And the investigation ended with the company agreeing to um, competition and privacy related conditions. Um, and, and then I think we keep sort of dancing around this uh, July 4th case from the top European court um, involving uh, the federal cartel office in Germany and Facebook. 
Um, but that case is interesting for the uh, cooperation point because it really reinforced the importance of this interagency cooperation. Um, the court essentially ruled, um, and Niccolo and anyone who does more European law can definitely add to and correct on this, but essentially ruled that competition authorities can consider privacy law violations when they're assessing an abuse of dominance. Um, and that's really significant because it sort of brings privacy law into antitrust law in a, in a, in a significant way. Um, but the court recognized that that creates the risk of inconsistent interpretations of privacy law. So the competition authorities and the privacy authorities could come to different conclusions about what is a privacy law violation. And so to minimize those sorts of inconsistencies, the court really emphasized, and I'm using their phrasing here, that the agencies have to consult and cooperate sincerely. Okay, consult and cooperate sincerely. Um, and that if there is an applicable decision in privacy law, the competition authority has to follow that decision. Um, so, so it's a really interesting case from the perspective that agencies were already cooperating or thinking about cooperating, but now they've really been directed to cooperate. So this is something that you will definitely see in the future. Um, I do wanna pause and just say, I. Agency structures certainly vary by jurisdiction. So the US and Colombia, for example, are a little bit unusual in that one agency enforces both competition and privacy law and to our early discussion, um, consumer protection law as well. Um, but I'm talking about the international norm, which is more often a separate agency for antitrust law and a, and a different agency that does privacy law. And when they're separate like that, a really common tool for their cooperation is a memoranda of understanding which is just an agreement between agencies. And they can vary really widely in what the MOU says and what the MOU actually does, right? Like does the agency actually bring the MOU to life in their collaboration? In the US, MOUs often will enable information sharing unless it's otherwise prohibited by statute, the referral of cases, you know, staff exchanges, but we're also seeing some jurisdictions think about statutory obligations on these agencies for example, the UK considered, should the privacy agency have to think about the effects on competition of its actions? And if you're gonna obligate the privacy agency to think about its effects on competition, maybe the best way to do that well is to require cooperation with the competition agency. And so I have an article about this with the University of Virginia. If you wanna read more about it, um, talking about how we can strengthen these sorts of interactions between um, agencies so they happen in, in an effective way. But from a practical perspective, I think you really do have to expect more information flow between these agencies and more of the types of matters where there's not just one enforcer, but actually two enforcers involved, which can certainly bring complexity to practice. Um, so it's, it also means it's valuable to have some of Ability as a privacy lawyer to spot competition issues and involve competition colleagues and vice versa. So a little bit more collaboration across in practice. Thanks. Thank you, Erica. Maria Paz? Yeah, very similar to Erica and coming back to the example of the what happened in the WhatsApp case in Brazil. Um, this is an example, a good example of how this happened in the practice, because there are like institutional limitation, what it was, uh, Erica was pointing out, there are different structures in different countries and, and the authorities have become more creative over the time in, in, in trying to find their way in, in which uh, this collaboration can happen in a concrete case. The Brazilian example, um, the, the three authorities, consumer uh, authority, data protection authority and antitrust authority, they came to together to, to uh, issue an order with recommendation for the company in the case of the update of the terms and condition and privacy policy for WhatsApp. And they, they, they try to integrate the different elements coming from the, the different uh, expertise in terms of like, uh, for example, demanding from the con consumer perspective um, to hold in, in the abusive uh, conduct that uh, it will imply, for example, to suspend the service for the user that didn't agree with the change in the terms uh, of condition and, and privacy policy, but also like coming from the data protection angle and um, uh, asking uh, the, the company to be much
much more transparent about what are uh, where like the, the concrete impacts and the elements of the change of the policy, which is something that it also was heavily criticized in other jurisdiction in terms that there was not enough clarity for the for the regular user about how those changes will imply uh, concretely them in the use of the service. So those are some of the elements that are relevant in terms, of, again, of like measuring how the theories of harm can be built from the different uh, fields of expertise in this case, from the data protection side, but also from the from the antitrust side. And I think that it, this is something that also can be seen in other uh, conduct cases that have been uh, uh, starting to, to pop up uh, in, in different jurisdictions in terms of like, uh, to the typology that it was presented by by Nico, um, uh, it was it's necessary to measure, for example, how much data uh, will create uh, the the leverage that it's uh, really uh, uh, represent and uh, and and a, a relevant risk for competition in terms of like um, uh, improving the dominance of the company in a different uh, market, using the dominant in one market for leveraging in, in the other one. In the same way, it will be necessary to cross collaborate in, in terms of like understanding what had been uh, the elements that the company have highlighted in terms of their privacy policies uh, uh, and, and the way in which they handle the data for determining if there is an abuse or not in the possibility of the consumer to have meaningful choices or to, to change or switch from one service to another in a, in a case in which, we, we, for example, we were thinking about an exploitative abuse. And for those elements, this um, capacity building need to be like cross pollinized in terms of like the 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 data uh, protection authorities need to understand what are the risks from the anti competitive side and the and the investigators on the antitrust side need to understand how the different data protection rules uh, can impact in, 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 in the meaningful choice at the individual level but also in the configuration of the market overall and how, for example, also the different uh, uh, data protection policies that different services can have can have an impact in the medium or long term in terms of the possibility to gather data to innovate. So, how we balance the two uh, the two elements, like having. Uh, uh, privacy policies that are protected of the, the individual choice, but at the same time, for example, ensuring that this is not creating a, a, a locking in in a particular company or type of services and ensuring that even with uh, being mindful of the uh, individual privacy or, 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 or ability to control personal data, it will not create a structure of the market that in the medium or long run will create more uh, harm for the overall uh, welfare of the society. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Camila. Um, just to um, touch upon the cooperation topic, um, here in Brazil, we have the cooperation agreement or memorandum of understanding between the, our competition authority and the data protection authority. Um, since 2021, it's it's in force. Um, but I, what I'd just like to point out is that it's very common for us to have um, several um, forums of discussion between the heads of the authorities. So you have the the commissioners of the competition authority and the directors of the data protection um, sitting and discussing, but it's not so common to have the staff meeting. Um, and I think it was a comment that uh, we had last year in the BRICS um, conference here, that it's very important for us to create uh, places where the staff, not necessarily the heads of the units discuss, because most of the time the staff uh, are those in charge of handling the case and really uh, getting their hands dirty uh, in, in the investigation. So just one point uh, about the, the cooperation topic. And um, just how Brazil is treating um, data protection in their uh, antitrust decisions. I think um, in Brazil, we have a very interesting roster of cases um, since um, um, uh, not, not only since the new data protection law, but even before, in which data protection has been treated in antitrust cases. Um, it has been an evolutionary um, 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 trajectory by the competition authority sometimes. In the few years ago, they declined their uh, jurisdiction to the um, consumer authority. 
And nowadays we have seen merger cases in which our general data protection law is uh, brought into the argumentation of the um, antitrust cases. What we don't see though is um, our competition authority referring the cases to the, to the data protection authority or um, asking for their opinion or how do they, or if the data protection concerns in that specific case are well-grounded. So maybe we could learn from the European case um, in which there's a lot of interaction between the, uh, the national competition authorities and the data protection authorities and foster this uh, more institutional cooperation between uh, the two authorities here in Brazil, especially when data protection is uh, data protection and privacy is in the heart of the of a merger case or a conduct case. So um, create a, a direct channel in which the authorities can um, ask for their how um, privacy um, should be considered in that specific case. Okay, briefly to complement by uh, bringing up the the. Facebook case that was already mentioned a few times now, uh, or meta platforms as it's called uh, by DCJ. So uh, until now, what has happened is, is that in a lot of cases, especially merger cases, uh, the authorities were saying, uh, oh, this is not our matter of competence. We'll leave it aside. And so increasingly in situations where um, the companies were combining data sets and potentially, as I was saying earlier, putting more at risk the individual, not necessarily creating a privacy violation, but increasing the risk. Then they were saying, ah, oh, no, don't worry, because there is always the right to data portability or the right to access and understand, you know, how your data are being treated. So we can be safe because there is a good enforcement of, well, they didn't say it, but implicitly they were assuming that there was a strong enforcement on the data protection side. Now, uh, the Facebook case was brought as exactly because the authority had the feeling that Facebook was uh, not processing the data uh, in compliance with the GDPR and not enough was being done in the data protection field. So what it uh, tried to do is saying here, uh, Facebook, you're not getting a valid consent for the uh, off Facebook data that you're collecting. What are the off Facebook data? Are those that um, are um, dependent on the cookies on the tracking of users on third-party sites. You know, when you have the like button in a site, uh, it means that you can like that site, of course, but also that even without liking that site, uh, Facebook knows that you are entering that site. And so it's able to use this information uh, for various purposes. Now, uh, the authority um, thought that this was basically a bundle uh, in a tying uh, situation or actually didn't characterize it as a time, but it said it's an unfair data processing. Uh, so it's a violation of the um, part of Article 102, uh, actually the German equivalent of Article 102, which is the uh, article on abuse of dominance, uh, which says that you are imposing unfair conditions to the users. So here, um, basically there was this question raised to the European Court of Justice asking, uh, can the competition authority rule upon uh, the legality of uh, the consent in this case, you know, or any data processing uh, conditions that would be the competence of the data protection authority? Or does it have to maybe uh, suspend the proceedings in order to ask uh, the data protection authority to first rule on that and then resume them? Uh, in this case, the cooperation was informal. So they talked to each other. Uh, but there was no uh, established mechanism for suspending the proceeding, for example. Now, as a uh, response, the European Court of Justice said, yes, you have to, um, first of all, look whether there is any ruling by the Data Protection Authority on that matter. Uh, and uh, if there is, you cannot depart from, from that from the, as a data protection matter. Um, secondly, if you, there is no ruling, but you are in, in doubt uh, about the legality of this practice, you can, uh, uh, yeah, you need to indeed ask this to the data protection authority and they have to respond within a reasonable period of time to you. Uh, now, they didn't say how much is that reasonable period of time. Uh, and what I criticize of this decision is that, uh, well, it creates in a way the incentive for the competition authorities to say, no, I have no doubt because I want to finish, you know, I want to publish a decision quickly my uh, 
my government sees that I'm doing a lot of enforcement. Uh, so I don't want to raise doubts, right? And so the, the only problem is that it doesn't create that incentive to, to transfer the matter to the data protection authority. Uh, maybe a way to improve this is to create some sort of uh, privacy council at the, data, at the competition authority that can help uh, bring up the doubts uh, or, you know, another way is to make sure that civil society can be heard and uh, that the authority does not just dismiss any concern uh, of hand. So, uh, yes, we, it's a good sign in terms of cooperation. It's creating a, a structure mechanism, which is good, but I don't think it's perfect. And I hope that if we adopt it all over the world, you know, we maybe, maybe make some improvement to it. Since we're talking about improvements, we would like to wrap up in the end talking about the future. But before that, we would like to hear you. Do you have any questions, any concerns on what we are saying? I know that sometimes we are using a lot of competition as lines, but <laughs> it is important to have this conversation. So uh, we would just have to use the microphone so they can hear. Do you have any questions? Come on, I know it's close to, to lunchtime. <laughs> yeah, also, also Slido. Thank you. Uh, I think my question is for the Brazilian ones. And, and I, I really want to know your perspective over the exploitative abuses, conducts, and this intersection between competition law and data protection. Because we are seeing like in other countries that we have some cases, as we are talking here, are meta cases, and maybe Google cases and other DMA cases that uh, uh, explore this exploitative abuse figure. But I, I, I always wonder if in Brazil we can use it like in without having a competence problem. Because every time we, we talk about consumer intersection, tax intersection, there is this competence problem. So I really want to know your opinion about this uh, topic. I'd like just to jump in. Uh, in. Uh, in in uh, Monica's question, um, considering well, this this thread case, it's not a, really a case. There's not a, a lodged case uh, before uh, the 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 data protection authority, but there there is this uh, ongoing studies, right? The, uh, that um, uh, the INPD um, um, published last last I think a couple of weeks uh, ago, and uh, the thing is. Well, uh, in uh, in e in the EU, there are some um, in the Court of Justice's judgment about the the, the, the meta case. There are a lot of uh, interpretive um, 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 a lot of interpretations, right, uh, about the, the the legal basis, uh, the uh, legitimate interests, um, the uh, the contract execution of of, of contract. And stuff, and we do not have this in Brazil yet. And um, the, I think the one additional, I mean, element or uh, something that uh, we should, or I, I wanted to you to consider is, in 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 Brazilian case, in considering this this specific case of threads, and we do not have these uh, uh, guidelines in any decisions. Uh, um, of the, the data protection authority about these uh, legal bases, and how how what do you think about you know should uh, the the um, the the you know yeah, your 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 thoughts about how how should this case develop and I mean the, the data protection authority should consider uh, uh, um, competition uh, aspects in this in this case. Can I just pick up on the question? Because I think it was a good one. Um, you pointed out that it, it, we've talked about the FCO case, so the July 4th case, like it can just be exported around the world, but actually it was an exploitative abuse case. So where there are differences in competition law, we're going to see differences in how this interaction develops. And the US, for example, doesn't really have active enforcement and exploitative abuse. So that's sort of like the idea of unfair use of data. So 
the the privacy and antitrust piece of it doesn't necessarily translate unless antitrust is the same in the other jurisdiction. So I think that's definitely a worthwhile point to just distinguish. I think actually the case is most useful for what it says about collaboration between agencies, as opposed to the substance of the antitrust um, law piece of it, which would not be applicable in the US. Thank you, Erica. Um, actually, I will, um, Maria Paz, before, sorry, before passing to Go you, ahead. I would uh, actually recommend, uh, since we are already out of time, to, uh, to answer the questions, uh, both from Monica and Diego, and to wrap up with your final remarks. Uh, so I, I would suggest three minutes up to four, so we can wrap up in here. And we were talking also about regulation. So if you could mention also the, the role of regulation, it would be interesting to talk about what are the, the roads ahead on the on this intersection between data protection and antitrust. So um, Maria Paz, I, I will start with you since you, since you were starting, but Erica, uh, I will pass over to you too. <laughs> don't, don't bother. Don't, don't bother. That. I mean, if you want to finish with your remark, Erica, I, please go ahead and I can jump later. <laughs> no? Okay. I mean, if not, my point was just connected to Erica's point. I think that all jurisdictions have struggled with uh, exploitative abuse conduct. <laughs> I think that is no, no, uh, any jurisdiction that in, in recent uh, time have a strong uh, file for exploitative conduct. I think that this case of digital markets is a particularly uh, good place in which that uh, theory can evolve from a doctrinal point of view. But it's precisely the point of uh, in which uh, there is much more collaboration needed in the sense that I was highlighted in my previous intervention, because for understanding what is abusive in terms of data protection or consumer protection, I think that it's for the, for the two of them, it works in the same way. The uh, uh, antitrust authorities need to be much more uh, knowledgeable about those fields of, 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 of law uh, or having a more direct collaboration and ensure that this is happening in a more effective way, either by the suggestion that Nicola was making, making of having a council, someone with that expertise in-house in the in the antitrust authority, or having these memorandums of understanding or institutional mechanism in which the, the cross-pollinization can actually happen. Otherwise, these theories, it will be really difficult to, uh, uh, to, to build, and it will happen when Monica was pointed out in her uh, question, which is like the, the, the excuse, the easy excuse for the authorities for taking this out of their place, is saying that this it's out of their scope of competence. And that cannot be anymore the case because we need that someone take the whole potato and do something about it. <laughs> So yeah, I, I, and my close remark on this, it will be like for this, I totally agree with what I think Nicola was pointed out and also something mentioned by Camila in terms of like, what could be the, the role of civil society organization um, uh, from the different fields, from the consumer protection side, from the antitrust activism and from, from privacy side or more extendedly digital rights uh, side in terms of like pushing this kind of, um, uh, cases and also like helping the the authorities to figure out how to to put the the, the pieces of the puzzle together i think that coming back to my my landmark case that i presented today the whatsapp case it was a good case in terms that there was a, a, a collaboration at the international level of many civil society organizations that were like pushing at the same time and providing information to the consumer data protection and uh, antitrust authorities in different jurisdictions to try to raise the attention and, and showing this connection between privacy and uh, antitrust. So I think that there, uh, 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 there is much more to continue doing. There is, there's this good example that already happening, but we need more activism on that and more interest from each one of the fields in connecting with the other. I will stop there. I think that it will, I will leave it open, the, the regulation question for my colleagues. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Paz. Before passing to, to Erika, I would just uh, highlight that I put in here uh, a link. Uh, if, you, if you cannot read online, it's bit.ly slash cpdp 
traço, <laughs> antitrust, <laughs> dash antitrust. Uh, in, in, in here, in this link, we have the references that were mentioned by, by the panelists. So we have the articles mentioned by Maria Paz, Erika, and also Nicolo and Bruno. So if you're interested, you can have access to all of them and they are open freely online. So Erika, could you make your final remarks? Thank you. So I'll, let me get back to where we started. I uh, said, warned, there, these areas of law are not sort of uniformly complementary, that they can have some tensions between them. So I'll circle back to where I think that's headed in a minute or less. So we talked today about U.S. competition law and globally understanding privacy as a factor in competition, both promoting consumer choice. For privacy, that often means notice and consent paradigms. But the emerging privacy paradigms that we see are really looking beyond notice and consent, right? They're looking to prohibitions on practices, duties on companies instead of solely consumer choice, privacy rights, which we also mentioned today. Those paradigms are not always about notice and consent or just choice. In fact, sometimes what they do that's so valuable is that they actually replace choice and the obligation to manage our own privacy with other rules about what companies can and can't do with our data. And we see a little bit of this at the state level. In the US, there's now 10 general state privacy laws that sort of echo GDPR. There's also a turn at the FTC towards privacy rulemaking. Um, and that rulemaking was described as a crackdown on harmful commercial surveillance and lax data security. That's pretty dramatic wording. So the FTC on the privacy side is becoming more skeptical over the value of commercial data processing itself, not just consent, but is this a good idea to build our economy around um, surveillance and, and data commodification? And so I think all of that means that at the very edges, we're gonna see the assumptions start to change between antitrust law and privacy law about whether data processing is good for consumers. Is it beneficial for consumers or is it sometimes harmful? And competition law tends to presume that it's beneficial. Privacy law is starting to question that assumption. So I think we're gonna see more exceptions where the two meet, the stronger that privacy law gets. And we know that it is strengthening around the world. Um, and so that's a big picture future item. Um, and it's the subject of a forthcoming paper I have with University of California. So all to say, watch this space. There's lots of interesting things happening in it. Thank you so much, Erica. I will pass to Nicolo and then Bruno. Thank you very much. So. Uh, quickly responding to, to the points. Uh, exploitative abuse is, uh, yes, it's difficult in all jurisdictions. In Brazil, uh, there, were, there were some cases in the past regarding excessive prices. However, uh, excessive prices was also, so there was a provision saying uh, it's in, in, illegal to in, arbitrarily increase profits, but it was removed from the last uh, version of the competition law. And also there was a quite a str strong discussion uh, among the commissioners, uh, particularly when uh, the, super, uh, the general superintendent was uh, Professor Carlo Ragazzo, who's a professor here at FGV. And he uh, basically summed up all the cases and said that antitrust should not be concerned with excessive prices. But if you take the constitution, you know, there are many values that can be used as a, as a hook to, uh, to justify this kind of actions, particularly, for example, there's one uh, principle that says that um, uh, uh, the economic order is based also on the reduction of uh, uh, social inequalities. So you can probably use this when consumers are being exploited, the most vulnerable parts of society. You know, you can argue that uh, there's a lot that can be argued based on the constitution. Uh, and I think the data part would fit also in that. But uh, we don't have the will right now to go after these kind of cases, maybe uh, later, uh, later on. Uh, now, another point that was raised is this one about the Facebook case. Um, the point that I didn't mention here is that the Facebook judgment has uh, several parts. One of those was about the cooperation. The other one was about uh, basically whether a consent is really, can be called free consent when it's given to a dominant company. And, uh, the court also spent some time saying, uh, well, when it's not necessary for uh, the operation of the service, then uh, it's not freely given consent. There should be the option to give consent to a version of the service that doesn't involve this third-party website data. Um, 
I don't know how would this would be applied in Brazil, but I think there is some uh, uh, some uh, support for the idea that uh, you know we can apply the same principles here, uh, and th the same uh, with with regard to. Uh, the contract, I think actually the consent and contract can be treated in a very similar manner. What is most problematic is the legitimate interest uh, that has no regulation here, right? And so I think we need to help the authorities to figure out, you know, how to measure uh, what is an unreasonable intrusion. Uh, we need some more guidelines in that respect. I don't know about the threads case. I'm happy to, to discuss later, Diego. Uh, but, um, okay, now going back to the final points, what can we do? Uh, I think uh, the authorities need to start measuring more, uh, particularly because sometimes, as I was pointing earlier, you try to use the data to uh, make an offer to somebody that they cannot refuse. So how can you measure these nudges? I think nudging uh, dark patterns is an area where you have the intersection of competition and privacy that uh, will be increasingly important and without access to the data. So this is something that is being now proposed by several regulations, including the Brazilian uh, fake news uh, bill and uh, the DSA in Europe. Uh, it involves allowing more access for researchers to understand the effects of content moderation choices, for example. So this would be a way forward to also for the authorities, the antitrust authorities to understand the, the effects of a certain conduct that involves most of the times in the digital space, content moderation. Um, and uh, then I think that in terms of uh, lessons, also we need to adjust the theories of arm uh, a little bit to recognize the particularities of data. Um, and uh, what I think also in the context of excessive prices, excessive data collection, we need to find a way to measure the preferences of consumers so that you can say, well, uh, this has gone beyond what they would have accepted. Uh, you cannot do this as in a blank state. You need to kind of measure what are the groups of users that you have who uh, gave consent to certain things being collected in a genuine way and who didn't. Um, and, and then finally, we need a clear uh, cooperation framework, right? Uh, we need uh, more uh, streamlined rules. Not just as it's been done today, uh, there are MOUs, uh, uh, agreements between uh, uh, data protection and competition authority that are more general. So they say, ah, we will uh, uh, inform each other, we will uh, hold conferences, we will uh, uh, think about theories of arm. But one problem is if you are a competition authority and you are in a case involving, you know, in your evidence, you have a data protection breach. Can you pass this information, which you know is problematic for the rights of defense of the company, to the uh, data protection authority? Like you need a confidentiality waiver uh, from the company, or you need an agreement that uh, preemptively already uh, facilitates this exchange of evidence. Uh, so I think that's another uh, blank uh, spot for us to think about how to improve. Um. I would just wrap up real quickly, um, trying to address Monica's question. Um, I'm really afraid of legal transplants. Um, I think in Brazil, we tend to look up to Europe and the West a lot in our antitrust uh, practice, um, not only the lawyers, but the, the authority itself. Um, and sometimes we don't really apply the way it should be applied or we don't take into consideration the idiosyncrasies of each jurisdiction. Um, I remember when I was writing my, my doctoral thesis, I came across a case in which the Brazilian Competition Authority employed the vertical merger guideline, the American mer vertical merger guidelines, um, but the VM, VMG had been withdrawn a year before and they were using it to um, reinforce the argument. So um, I'm really curious to see how the Facebook decision is gonna be um, applied, in, applied or understood in Brazil. Um, it's the topic that Entertus has been talking about for the past two weeks, and there's lots of different interpretations about it. Uh, but I, I would bet that we're going to see it cited in, any, in, a, in Brazilian decisions very soon. Um, and I don't know if we're going to if it's going to be in the correct way, um, applying the tiers of harm that we're using in Europe um, in the Brazilian context uh, without taking into consideration our um, um, the, the specifics of the of the Brazilian law. So, what I would say is that 
uh, uh, we just need to be real careful about how we import those those decisions. And as Erica said, the cooperation part of it is very important. I think that we can we can take into consideration very much here. Um, and just to um, finish, and um, one of the points Camila raised about regulation, uh, we're talking about a lot of um, antitrust here, uh, but it's interesting to see that the main piece of legislation that changed the what we talk about the DMA, it's a regulation piece, uh, not necessarily a change of um, antitrust laws. So I think that's we we need to be looking into it very um, very carefully. And just to finish. Uh, I think our challenge uh, ahead of us is to, especially the those in charge of the investigations and the decisions, we should understand that nowadays it's not possible to enforce competition law um, without including data protection, privacy concerns. I think that's that's the message I'd like to to end this panel. Well, thank you. That was really interesting and. It is interesting also that we are having like a multi-jurisdictional and multi-stakeholder in, in some ways debate and we have a lot of consensus. But uh, we have to say that we have used more uh, competition slangs and competition uh, lens of competition and we have not entered, for example, on the uh, data protection analysis by itself. So we could have other panels on, on these intersections also considering other lens. I know that some of you are data protection lawyers, so we would love to talk more with you in hallways and et cetera. But you can see that we have a lot of challenges in the future. So access these references that we have shared with you in this link. And thank you so much for being here, even with the delay. And thank you, panelists, Erica, Maria Paz, Nicolo, and Bruno for this. See you. Uh, once again, thank you, Camila, for organizing this. I hope we can continue this conversation also in the next uh, CPDP LATAM by organizing another panel. And I want to thank the two remote speakers that uh, uh, honored us with their presence from afar. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's what uh, we want to do here, uh, encourage everybody to participate. Uh, so thanks a lot again.